afternoon everyone, it's Debbie Evans and Rolo here. Um, we're looking out at a little bit of a snow flurry, not too bad though, not settling too much. So today we're going into the second book in the series, the Chilvester Passage, and this is chapter five and it starts off with Ro um, the smiley lady and the floppy haired boy going to the dentist and Rolo coming with us. Both humans had checkup appointments with the dentist and so they took it in turns to go into the surgery and whoever wasn't in the chair having their mouth examined had to stand outside with me as dentists don't seem too keen on having dogs in their surgery. I peered through the window. I would have liked to have had a ride in that cool chair and had my teeth counted by a lady wearing rubber gloves and a mask. If you remember, I lost one corner tooth whilst giving a tug at the secret trapdoor under the sink when I first discovered it last year. It seems the dentist is not very friendly. She's probably a cat person. Bah. On our way home, we stopped at the cafe in the redundant church where I am allowed to go inside and the smiley lady and floppy haired boy chose a piece of homemade cake each, coffee and walnut for the smiley lady and carrot cake for the floppy haired boy. Very healthy after the dentist, I thought, but kept it to myself as I was given a water bowl and a dog biscuit for being a good boy. St Peter's is a very old church dating back to Tudor times. You may recall I had an adventure during the ordination of Thomas Wolsey. For now, my lead was f firmly tied to a chair leg. I settled down. Glancing at some exposed bricks on the crumbling plaster-covered wall behind the grand piano, I found myself thinking that the wall had stood there for a very long time indeed and must have seen a fair few comings and goings. It was then that I noticed a patch of missing plaster and the floppy-haired boy followed my gaze. I'm sure we saw the same thing at exactly the same time. On the wall, clear as anything, was the outline of a dog's profile in the old brickwork and I have to say it looked pretty much like a portrait of yours truly. I'm just going to show you the picture there so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Another little treat for Rolo. Of course I couldn't say any of this out loud but I sat staring at it with my feet gathered in whilst the floppy-haired boy drew his mum's attention to it. Oh, I say, it looks just like Rolo, she exclaimed, the last to notice. The floppy-haired boy untied my lead from the chair leg and led me over to see my likeness on the wall. I can't really describe what happened next, except to say I had a strange feeling creep all over my fur. I suppose it's what you might call goosebumps. This dog mural needed further investigation but not now and not with my people. I spied a fire exit near the altar and it looked like the wood at the bottom of the door had rotted away. Someone had placed a plank of wood across the gap to keep the drafts out. I would have to come back later under the cover of darkness for a closer look at the mural and that door could be my way in. We had a fairly uneventful afternoon. I barked at the postman and sniffed around at the falling fence with the rabbits huddled in their hutch behind. The smiley lady said she really must alert the neighbours as to the state of their fence. I couldn't sleep for thinking about that dog on the wall. Later that night, when the sounds of the house had gone quiet, I kicked off my blanket and crept out through my secret trapdoor and ran down the hill as fast as I could to the old church. The high street was, silence, was silent, shops shuttered, businesses closed up for the night and residents tucked up in bed with curtains firmly drawn. The silver moonlight shone on the church clock on the bell tower and showed the time to be just a little before midnight. I skirted around the outside of the church, keeping close to the walls, and found my way to the end of the church with the biggest stained glass window, and I soon found the door with the rotted wood along the bottom. I nudged at the plank of wood with my nose and it fell with a clatter. I squeezed under the door through the small dog-sized gap. I was inside at the right end of the church. 
All was quiet, save for the chiming of twelve. The helpful moonlight threw beams of light onto the flagstone floor, and where the light came through the stained glass windows, it made pools of rich colour on the Minton tiles. No time to investigate that now. I was drawn to the dog mural on the wall next to the chancel behind the piano. I crossed the transept and approached it on tiptoe as my claws made a skittering noise on the tile, interrupting the silence of the church. As the last stroke of midnight rang out, an eerie glow surrounded the dog on the wall like a halo and I moved in closer. The brickwork yawned open in the blackness, revealing a dog-shaped passageway just about my size. The passage smelt musty and damp, twice as pungent as the odour of old church buildings. I was hesitant about taking the next step and actually crossing the threshold. I pushed my nose in and wrinkled it. To my surprise, a tiny glow flickered just inside the passageway. It was Yulia. Boy, was I pleased to see her. I called out to her and she waved her lantern. Paddy Paws, you found it. Athelstan said you would. We weren't allowed to help. Clever boy, finding it all by yourself. Where are we, Yulia? What is this passage? Is it another entrance to the time tunnel? I was so excited that all my sentences ran into each other. There you can see Yulia's outline through the mural of the dog on the wall. Slow down, Paddy Paws, one thing at a time. Come inside and don't be scared. I will light your way just as before. This is the Chilvester Passage. Athelstan knew you would find it and he has a very urgent, important job for you. Come quickly and I'll show you. Where am I going, Yulia? Does it link to the time tunnel? What's the mission? I asked eagerly, trying to take in the new surroundings and keeping an ear up in the gloom of the tunnel in case of sound, following Yulia's swinging pinprick of light as she strode on ahead. You will know when we get there, she said mysteriously, and I felt as if I could be talking to Athelstan himself. I followed the tiny light through the dark passage and wondered where on earth this adventure might take me. It certainly smelt very old, as if it had been closed up for a hundred years or more. Yulia explained along the way that this was not in any way linked to the time tunnel. The passage was last used by a dog called Chilvester, hence its name. He was alive during Victorian times and used to do good deeds in orphanages, workhouses and hospitals, helping humans and especially children whenever he could. He always travelled in secret and usually at night. Chilvester lived a long and happy life, but after his death the secret way had remained hidden and unused until this very day. Only the guardian of the time tunnel and the woodland folk knew of his ex its existence. You really are the chosen one, you know, said Yulia, echoing Athelstan's words for the second time that night. It wasn't a long journey, but it was very dark and unfamiliar. The little lantern spluttered, casting just enough light to help us edge forward. We fell into companionable silence. The cave-like ceiling dripped rusty, smelling water, which was cold and made me shiver when it hit my fur. I stopped and shook it off every now and then. Eventually, we came to a dead, dead end. We seemed to have come up against a solid wall. Have we taken a lot wrong turn? I asked my guide. I can't remember what Athelstan said about how to exit the tunnel, said Yulia, staring hard at the obstacle in front of us as if willing it to open, and when it didn't, she shook her head in frustration. I felt sure she was about to stamp her tiny foot, so I shoved ahead with my nose, which I'd discovered to be a very useful tool. The obstruction, which was in fact a door, fell away with an alarming bang. Bravo, shouted Julia, as she scuttled back down the passageway the way we'd just come. OK, I'll carry on from here then, I said to Yulia's retreating back, trying to sound braver than I felt. I was left alone, wondering what to do next. I put my paws on what seemed to be a ledge and peered out into the gloom of the night. There was nothing else for it but to jump, be brave and plunge into the unknown. 
I counted to three and then, quite gingerly, screwing up my face and bracing myself, I launched forward and fell just a few inches, landing four square on my paws in the fresh air. The door closed behind me on an invisible hinge with a metallic thud and on its exterior face was a sign saying the Talbot Cafe painted in gold. Further investigation showed me that I was on the outside of a very old building. I glanced up and saw wide steps and columns leading up to the covered entrance. Moving down onto the pavement and looking up at the roof, I could see a spire. Presumably this was a church. That made sense. It seemed that the Chilvester Passage ran from one church building to another. But where on earth was I? And why had Athelstan wanted me to come here? Well, I'm going to resume that story tomorrow at 3.30 with the next chapter. But I will just explain to you that the Chilvester Passage, that... that um, picture of the dog on the brickwork is actually a, a, something I really did see but it wasn't in St Peter's Church in Marlborough it was in a pub called The Boot in Tisbury and when I saw the outline of Rollo on the wall in this ancient brickwork I could not believe my eyes and took a photograph and um, went home used my very overactive imagination and moved the Chilvester passage to the interior of St Peter's Redundant Church in Marlborough High Street, which makes it much more accessible for Rolo, of course. So thank you very much for listening. You'll find out tomorrow where the Chilvester Passage has brought Rolo out to and what his mission is in that place. So thank you for listening and hope you don't have too much snow. Bye for now.